Jane Ludington. Thank you very much and welcome. Good morning. Um, I'm Jen Ludington. I've been in the health business now for 30 odd years. Prior to that, I was doing farming and didn't wash the sheep with Amway. I wish I'd known. <laughs> anyway, what I'd like to talk to, to you today about is some of my teaching work. I taught for many years to try and help uh, different uh, groups in Canberra. So I worked in the uh, universities, the TAFE colleges, and I used to have a, a clinic, a large clinic, and I taught every second weekend. The premise that I'd like to start with today is we all have a body clock. <clears throat> now, from this book, we have um, Touch for Health or Kinesiology or Applied Kinesiology. I've gone as high as I can go in the applied kinesiology field, and if you have a good chiropractor, then that's what they do too. So the body has a clock. The clock works at certain times in the day, and it works really, really well. So that <clears throat> if you understand the day should start with the large intestine, we're supposed to get up and pass our toxins as soon as we arise. Our stomach then works between seven and nine. It doesn't work at any other time of the day. So if you're going to miss breakfast, you're actually missing a great opportunity. Our spleen then kicks in between nine and 11, and that looks after the blood and the cleanliness of the blood. The heart works between 11 and one, small intestines between one and three. So that's the next best time to eat. So if you're going to have a lunch, around about one o'clock is a great time to eat. Uh, the bladder then kicks in and the kidneys, then we start to lose our energy at that point. If we haven't had enough water, and yes, awesome water is the way to go. So if you haven't had enough water through the day there, it actually means that you'll start to lose your energy and start to feel tired at the end of the day instead of refreshed and ready to go out and have a dinner or uh, go out dancing or go out and you know have a nice time with your family. Um, this is perhaps the third time to eat and it should be a lighter time to eat. Then the triple warmer kicks in between 9 and 11. The best time to go to bed is actually at around 10, 10.30. Then the body starts to heal itself at that time. As we sleep, the body does a healing. So it starts with the triple warmer, which is the last stage of digestion. Then the gallbladder kicks in, the liver kicks in, and the lung. If you're awake at any of those times of the night, the emotional aspect of the triple, the gallbladder, the liver, or the lung is at work. So if someone comes in to me and says, I can't sleep, I'm awake every night at 3 a.m., I go, okay, your liver's playing up. What are you cross about? What are you frustrated with? What are you angry about? because that will let you know straight away. So the timing of the day actually lets me know when people make um, a complaint about their sleep patterns or their work patterns, you can actually identify it immediately by knowing about your body clock. The body clock then moves into uh, an area where it, it will work across the clock as well. So the stomach uh, actually works with your circulation your heart actually works with your gallbladder and it keeps crossing uh, the clock to give you the benefit of the day and also the benefit of the night. I studied for many years with someone called Glyn Brady. He was a metaphysician and also a great healer. I studied with Dr. Bruce and Joan Dew from New Zealand and they taught health professionals around the world for many years. So I spent about 10 years with him and a lady in Melbourne called Karen Franks. So they were great influences with me to actually go ahead and learn Touch for Health and then kinesiology. I've been doing this now for 30 years, so there's a lot of experience. And um, I'd like, as we go through this, if anyone's happy uh, to uh, go and be a demonstration for me, then I would like some people to take part, if that's OK. My three children uh, is really why I started healing. Um, my son had glue ears and my daughter had asthma. And medically, they couldn't quite find out what the problem was. Having learned this in the very first time I'd ever studied it um, with Glenn Brady, he did a session with both my children and the asthma was gone instead of six days in an oxygen tent every time she became unwell. And my son, having had four operations and grommets in his ears, actually never had a, any further problems with his ears after that. So that was one session with the person called Glyn Brady. And 
me trying to do this even though I didn't understand it at the time. The body clock then continues. <coughs> if I could wheel this around, it'd be great. Um, <coughs> the body clock continues then and we go into uh, a cycle of understanding uh, where we've been and where we come from. So we have um, from naught to 12 divides into four sections. So from naught to three or four, your mother or the person who does the most caring for you, be it male or female, has a huge influence on how you learn. And that goes through then for the rest of your life. So your learning is, is so important. And in little children, if anyone has small children, you must realise that the learning that goes on between naught and four is absolutely paramount. From three, four through to uh, seven, um, the father then takes the main role. So if you're a dad, for goodness sake, spend the time with your children, be involved, because that relationship actually teaches children uh, all about uh, relationship, how to relate in later life, and your work ethics and principles. They're actually taught at a very, very early age. Then we go through into... Um, <coughs> from seven till 10, and the grandparents are very, very important because they actually teach you unconditional love and they teach you about your history. So even in the stories that they tell and just the fact that they're with you uh, in a complete way and then they hand you back, as I do with mine, um, but it does give a great bond. Then the teachers become very, very important. So for children, they start to relate to the teachers that they have and teachers teach you about your future. They begin the training and your love of learning will go on, if that's a successful area in your life, it will go on for the rest of your days. Friends then become important at around 10 through to 13 or so. And a good friendship with a child is a really, really important thing. If kids make uh, a connection with somebody that isn't so good, then as a parent, you're wise to actually um, disencourage that because this will keep people in a grounded way for the rest of their life and this is where they learn balance. So if you can be grounded and be balanced by the time you're 13, and of course we have a hormonal time at that point, so it's a very, very important area to take care of. The time frames that we, we then look at is that uh, we go through to 24, that's the second cycle, and we are doing all the first beginnings, your car, your home, your career. We go through to 36, and that's then when um, the body says, um, I've had the family, I've got a good career, I've, I've started life well, and then it says, thank you very much, I've done everything for you, now can you please take over? And hopefully we have good habits at that point in time to actually then be able to look after ourselves well enough. We go through then to 48, and 48 is a time where a lot of people are discontent. We've had a career, we want to have another career, we're fed up doing what we're doing. And so at 48, the body sort of says, well, <clears throat> I think it's time for a change. Uh, for the guys, um, a lot of men actually have a problem between 44 and 48 and in my 30 years of experience a lot of guys have died during that time so it's a very important four years for you gentlemen to take care of yourselves. Then we go through to 60 and it's like the last large lap. <laughs> so um, it means that in, from that point onwards you really need to get out there and enjoy yourself and make the most of life. Um, 72 then, it comes up the challenge about uh, what time does one have left? What else does one need to do? Uh, have you completed the goals of your life? Uh, are you on track for where you need to be? Then we come to 84, and a lot of people choose to leave the earth plane at that point in time. We're actually meant to depart by the time we're 96 but a lot of us don't make it to that point. We're not well enough, we're not able enough, and we're not well enough 
equipped to actually stay in, in a good space to do that. We also have a challenge line. At eight, we learn about, uh, by looking at our parents, we make our decisions for relationship for the rest of our lives. At 20, we make our decisions about what we're going to do and where we're headed with all the firsts that we do. At 32, 33, we're making a decision about what we're going to do uh, between here, 66, and would you believe it, 99. So it's a huge challenge point. At 44, we have another challenge time. It's usually health related. And at that time, it's, it's uh, really worth putting into practice all the good practices that you need to take care of yourself. Another challenge at 56 is usually around retirement and the questions about where, what, when and how. And then at 68, it really is what are my last wishes, what, are, what would I like to do? So that's the next uh, layer of the body clock. And when I work with someone, I check that we have the original body clock working then if there's a reoccurring problem, we have a look, did it come from that original cycle or which other cycle did it come from? And in understanding this, if you have a couple and they had a problem in this area, which may have related further out, um, and you have a problem in, let's say, the learning area, then the couple later will have problems and they don't know where that, that problem has come from. So be it a work team, be it a relationship, be it a family group, you can actually do tremendous counselling work from understanding this body clock. We have four different types of uh, people. And if I could ask of Victoria, she's a beautiful example of a visual lady. So in the NLP field, Victoria is an amazing visual person. She's got a beautiful triangular face, sees things as pictures and makes instantaneous decisions. And then at times, if she doesn't do her deciding, then she ends up where she doesn't want to be. Um, if I could ask Brad or Kale, very unusual to have two old factory people in here, but it means that you have the same visual qualities, except you use your taste and your smell to a great degree. Um, we have uh, in Andrew uh, an auditory person, so he hears well, he speaks well, he remembers things, and it actually, um, it, it's like he remembers so much that he's um, almost a radio station at times. So either very quiet or what he says is worth listening to. The kinesthetics, um, we've got um, Neil. Uh, Neil's a kinesthetic, so it means that you work from the heart. You always try and do your best. Um, it may not always come out that way because people are um, not necessarily taking that way, it that way. Anyway, that's a small portion of what I do. And um, so that's part of the work that I do, but it's part of the teaching work I do. So it's great for uh, people, friends, families, and all companies to understand why things work and why they don't. Thank you all very much.